now. And okay. I think we can start now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the word to our dear guest, I want to introduce our team. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Edwin Vasvi. I'm resident in neurosurgery in Varna, Bulgaria. These online education meetings have started with the initiative of Associate Professor Hassan Kamil Suju, who is also the program manager of the neurosurgery department in Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital, Turkey. This education program goes on with the contributions of all the residents in the same hospital and at the same time with the contribution of neurosurgery assistants of Turkish origin in other countries like me, who are happy to see the increasing numbers of participants day by day. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture in order to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions not by opening your microphones, but by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentations, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussions in, is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. And now I would like to introduce our guest. It is my privilege to introduce our lecturer, Dr. Jean-Yves Main. Dr. Jean-Yves Main is specialized in physical medicine and rehabilitation manual medicine, rheumatology, and human anatomy. He has been head of the Department of Physical Medicine in the Hot, Hot, Hotel du Hospital of Paris for 28 years. And he ended up his hospital career as a consultant, as a consultant at Hospital Cochin in Paris. He has many qualifications, which include Master of Human Anatomy, University Diploma of Manual and Orthopedic Medicine, specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation, specialist in rheumatology. He has titles which include in 1991, uh, uh, Pretitian Hospitalier, in 2005, Associate Professor at the College de Medicine du Hospital du Paris. He has professional positions which include from 1991 until 2018, head of the Department of Physical Medicine in Paris, France, France in between 1990 and 2014, editor in chief of the Revue de Medicine Manuel Osteopathy, the French Quarterly for Manual Medicine, 2001, organization of the ESSL ELS in instructional course in Paris, France, between 2001 and 2006 president of the French Society of Manual Medicine. Between 2008 and 2020, consultant in the Department of Physical Medicine, Cushing Hospital, Paris, France. Professional interests. Dr. Main has authored 75 scientific studies and more than 100 chapters of books and articles. He is the author of five books for medical or general audience. His research has been focused on back pain. He started studying the anatomy of the dorsal primary ramen with the first description of an entrapment neuropathy of the cutaneous dorsal ramus of L1 at the iliac crest, the natural history of this herniation with the first description of a progressive decrease in size with time in a large series. He studied the indications, contraindications, complications, mechanism of action and safety rules in spinal manipulation. He researched the role of the sacroiliac joint in low back pain and is a major contributor in coccidinia. He has managed the Diploma of Manual Medicine of the Paris Descartes University for 25 years. Scientific societies. Dr. Main is a senior member of the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine and of the French Society of the Rheumatology physical medicine and manual medicine. He was of, for 18 years, the editor in chief for, of the Review du Medicine Manuel Osteopathy, the French quarterly for manual medicine. Research grants. Dr. Main has been awarded by the European Academy of 
Rehabilitation 1988, the Interna International Federation of Manual Medicine 1993, and Sanofi International 1994 for his research in back pain. So please, well, sir, we're very happy to see you. You can start. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, you know my career better than me. Very, <laughs> very, very nice presentation. Okay, so we will start this presentation. Uh, okay, écran partagé. This one. Okay. Is it okay for you? You see my my slide? Yes. Okay. So yes, everything is perfect. Okay, so we we we start immediately with this uh, presentation, which is a, a summary of all my work in the field of uh, coccidinia. Uh, I uh, I wrote. Uh, more than 20 publications in the uh, international literature on this topic. And the last one, number 21, is about uh, the, the results of the conservative treatment. Uh, uh, I really, I can say that I am a specialist of this problem. Uh, I will skip the history of coccidinia, which is not convenient for the presentation, and start by the definition. It's important to have a clear definition of coccidinia. It is a, a local pain. There is no radiation. Typical coccidinia does not radiate to the perineum or to the back. It's very localized uh, on, over the coccyx area. And the second uh, feature of this uh, pain syndrome is that it is worse in the sitting position or sometimes worse when the patient gets out from the seat, get up from the, from the seat. So it's very important to have a clear definition. My first contribution in, the, in this field was the description 30 years ago of what I called dynamic fields. Uh, the technique was before the dynamic fields to take an X-ray in the standing or in the lying position, but not in the sitting position, which was really the painful position. And I, I had this idea and started to investigate my patients with these dynamic films. And uh, very quickly, we had a lot of interesting results. So uh, this is a short summary of the technique. It is a lateral film. You start with a stonic film first, and then you ask the patient to sit, but to, to sit on, on a real seat, on a stool, or on a chair, or what you want, but not on the, on, the, on, the, on the platform here of the radiologic board. It is not comfortable, and one buttock is out of the platform, so it's not good. The patient should be seated on a real stool like that, uh, and uh, start with uh, a straight back. And if the patient doesn't feel the pain very quickly, you can ask him or her to lean progressively back until the familiar pain is felt. On the radiologic table, there is a handle here on, in the rail, and the patient can grasp the handle and hold the handle and lean progressively backward until the familiar pain is felt. And uh, third, the X-ray beam should be focused on the coccyx. It's not necessary to see the lumbar spine. Uh, it's better to have a, a, a real focused, closed view on the, on the coccyx. Reading the film is not very difficult. Uh, first, if there is an obvious lesion of the coccyx, such as a luxation or a fracture or a big spiracle, it's not necessary to superimpose the film. But in the other case, it's very useful. And the way of reading the film starts with a superimposition of the two sacrums on the spotlight. You see the image on the, on the right side, and there is a sketch here. Um, when the sacrums are superimposed, you can see just one sacrum, but of course, if there is a mobility, you see two coccygeus. And so you can measure the angle of mobility, 
The summit of the angle, the top of the angle, is the first mobile disk. In many cases, the, mobile, the disk between S5 and C1 is not mobile, it is fused or immobile, rigid. And in these cases, the summit of the angle will be the second disk. So you can measure, you have an angle of mobility. It is also possible to measure a second angle, uh, which is the pelvic sagittal rotation. To superimpose the coccyx, you have to rotate the sitting field. Uh, because when you sit down, there is a rotation of the, of the pelvis. And the amount of this rotation is the pelvic rotation. You see here, this angle here, it's around 30 degrees. It is important because it is one of the two criteria of good quality film. The first criteria should be that the sagittal pelvic rotation has to be more than, let's say, 30 degrees. If it is not the case, you can, in some, there is some lesion which you will not see. Look at the film here, standing film. You see the coccyx is here, sorry, the coccyx is here and the three vertebrae are in line. There is no visible lesion. In this first sitting film, you see that the angle of rotation is very low. We can see that the two sacrums are quite parallel. And if you look at the coccyx, it is the same. There is no lesion. If you look at the third coccyx here with a better angle of sagittal rotation, 30 degrees, you can see that there is a dislocation of the coccyx. It's not clear because we have some pictures here superimposed, but you can believe me, it is important to check this angle. So the patient has to really uh, sit in a comfortable position. If he sits by uh, tightening the pelvic muscle, tightening the buttocks, making them very strong because he is afraid of the pain, the angle will be under 20 degrees and that is the the second criteria is that the familiar pain should be felt when the film is taken. This is also important. He, the same, the same X-ray standing, it's normal. You see, the coccyx is absolutely normal. Look at this disc. Standing with no pain, again, the uh, coccyx is in line. The two vertebrae are strictly in line. And third, this uh, image with uh, coccyx in the painful position. I hope you can see that there is a dislocation at the tip of the coccyx. So it's very important. First, the familiar pain should be felt when you take the film. And second, the pelvic should be rotated more than 30 degrees. These are the two criteria of a good quality film. The usual values in normal subjects is that uh, the mobility is around 10 degrees of flexion or sometimes in extension. 20% of the kids are rigid coccygeous and the average mobility should not exceed 20 or 25 degrees. Now, we will see the different lesions that have been described with this technique of uh, dynamic, dynamic fields. The first lesion is the posterior dislocation or luxation. This is the same. Luxation is an English term, English word. Dislocation is more in the US. The second lesion is a hypermobility inflection, then spikal, and other lesions such as fracture or dysplasia. We will see that at the end of my presentation. Um, this posterior dislocation, you see a very good example here with the coccyx in the standing position, which looks absolutely normal. And in the sitting position, you can see that the lower part of the coccyx is fixated in a backward direction with only a, a small contact here between the two bones. It's very important to see this image, which is absolutely typical of a dislocation. There is another example here on the, on the right side. 
starting position because this is in line, it's normal, you can see nothing. And in the sitting, painful position, you can see that there is uh, a tilt, a backward tilt of the coccyx or a, a slipping movement of luxation. <coughs> and you can imagine that when the two surfaces here are rubbing one against another, it can be very painful. So the luxation is accounts for 25% of the cases. It can be complete, a full luxation, 100%, or it can be a partial uh, luxation. I call that a subluxation. And uh, the major feature is that it is spontaneously reducible when standing up and uh, visible only in the sitting position. Either joints can be affected, sacral or intercoccygeal. Uh, there is no rule. Uh, here are some other examples. You can see here, it's absolutely obvious that there is a full luxation, 100%, and here it's only a partial luxation. It is interesting to look at this bubble of gas into the rectum. In the sitting position, you can see that there is an increase of pressure in the pelvis due to the sitting position. And this is this increase of pelvic pressure, intrapelvic pressure, which pushes backward the coccyx. This is the mechanism of this movement. Hypermobility in flexion is completely different. It's also 25% of the cases, but the displacement is in flexion. And by definition, it is a flexion of more than 30 degrees. I remind you that the, the maximum which is observed is 20, 25 degrees. So we need a clear cut value of 30 degrees. Look at this coccyx here in the sitting position. It is completely normal. And here you can see that there is a flexion. If you superimpose the two films, you can see first that there is an important pelvic rotation around 50 degrees, which is absolutely normal. And the flexion of the coccyx is around 20, 21 degrees. So this is too much. And you can see also another feature of hypermobility. Very often there is a step in the anterior wall. And this step is partial anterior subluxation. Here are some other examples <laughs> of uh, hypermobility. Sorry. Here you can see that there is important subluxation here too and this is always between 30 and 30 or 40 degrees of flexion and here the hyperflexion is accompanied not by a uh, partial subluxation but by a uh, pinching a narrowing of the disc which resembles exactly uh, what we see in a knee in an osteoarthritic knee arthritic knee when there is a, a pinching of the joint space when the patient is in the standing position. So it's really a functional investigation. The last image of a hypermobility, you see when the patient is standing, it is normal, but in the sitting position, the flexion, the amount of flexion is 45 degrees. And there is also a narrowing at this level and some features of osteoarthritis, which make the sitting position painful. The third lesion, which is uh, which can be observed on the, on the dynamic films, and it is visible on the normal films, but it was not described before my first description in 2000, is the presence of a coccygeal spicle. Spicle is a, a bony expressions. Uh, it's spoon. It's very acute at the tip of the coccyx here, and of course. It is jutting out or protruding under the skin. And it can be very painful on some occasions. It's very irritative. It accounts for 15% of the cases of chronic coccidemia. And of course, it is more frequent or more symptomatic when the coccyx is rigid. If the coccyx is very supple, uh, there is no, no problem with the, with the spicle. But uh, when the coccyx is rigid, the patient sits down, there is no flexion, 
there is no way for the coccyx to escape to, to the compression due to the spicule on the subcutaneous tissues. And also, it is more symptomatic in slim patients. In obese patients, you can see sometimes cycle, but they are never symptomatic because these patients have, have a lot of fat in the buttocks, which is a natural cushioning and very protective. So here are some other examples on an MRI, on a CT scan like this, you see, or on a normal film. Uh, it, it's very easy to, to see that uh, when, when you are uh, accustomed to this uh, lesion. One of the particularity of this lesion is that it is very often associated with a skin abnormality, such as a, a skin attraction inside or a pit in the skin, or even a pylonidal sinus, as you can see here. There is a clear association between the presence of the pylonidal sinus and a spiker. It is the same disease, of course. The coccyx is attracted to the outside and the skin is attracted to the inside and uh, hence the presence of a hole in the skin. So when you examine your patient, you should pay attention to the skin. We will see that uh, in the clinical examination. Some other lesions are not exactly spiked, but very close. It's the same problem. I call them dysplasia. It can be a retroversion of the coccyx. You see, it's exactly like a big spiker. It can be an acute inflammation of bursa. You can see here. Or even it can be a quite normal coccyx without spiker, but with an acute termination, with an acute uh, tip here and without any mobility in the sitting position. So it's really easy to see from this film that the, the, the coccyx is pressing on the, uh, on the skin, uh, creating an irritation and hence the source of, of the pain. There are also some examples of dysplasia in younger patients, it is visible in adolescents with the protrusion is not at the tip of the coccyx, but the protrusion is at the sacrocalcigeal angle, you see, it's very impressive. And the, this is the patient, this is the X-ray, and uh, there is a, a correction with the growth. Uh, uh, and the young patient becomes an adult, the problem uh, disappears because of the bone remodeling. Here are some other examples. This uh, young lady was an exception. Uh, there was a protrusion of this part of uh, S5, and there was a surgical removal of this part to, to treat her. This is not very frequent, but it is important to have this image in, in mind. And you can see here, this is not a bursitis. Uh, this is only the sacrococcygeal angle protruding under the skin in a young patient. And now we will see the last problem, the fractures. I described in a recent article the uh, different fractures, the different types of fracture affecting the coccyx. We have three types depending on the level of the fracture. The type one affects either S5 or C1, it is a direct choix. The type two affects C2, affects the middle vertebra of the coccyx. We will see that it is a compression of the vertebra. And the type three is an obstetrical fracture. It's very, very interesting to have some information about this fracture because they are missed in the majority of the cases. First uh, uh, type, type one, it is a fracture of S1 or C1, of S5 or C1, it is a direct trauma. It is very simple. It is the most frequent type of fracture and there is no difficulty for the diagnosis and the healing is always achieved in a couple of weeks, in two months, there is no longer any problem. No, there is never a pseudo uh, arthritis. <coughs> in some cases, the pain, the pain may persist after two months. So I recommend to take dynamic films because uh, an associate dislocation, associated luxation, may be observed. You see the fracture here. 
So there is a consolidation. Uh, there is no, no mobility here. But as you can see, there is a luxation which needs to be treated. But these fractures are not a problem in the practice. The type two is much more difficult. It affects the middle vertebra. It affects uh, this vertebra and only in the case of a triangular vertebra. You see, it's a very uh, specific shape of vertebra with a small anterior side and a larger posterior side. Um, this is a fracture due to a compression. And as you see, there are some fragments here. Here you have another example with two fragments separated by this fracture line. On the scanner, it is visible, but you can see that on a normal plane film, it's not so easy to see the fracture line, which is here, of course, it is difficult. So the mechanism is a nutcracker mechanism uh, with the branch, the arms of the nutcracker being this part of the sacrum and this part of the coccyx, and the, the vertebra behaves like the nut is crushed and in two parts. So it's very easy to miss. The only way to see it is to have a CT scan. Some other example, here the, the, the fracture line is here, not very visible. In the sitting position, there is a small a separation of the two fragments. And on the CT scan, it is visible that there is a fracture line at this level. So you understand that it's very difficult to miss. I think that in the majority of the cases, there is no uh, spontaneous healing, no consolidation of the fracture, and it leads to a pseudo arthrosis and to chronic continuous pain. So you need to take dynamic films and to have a CT scanner of the coccyx. So other example, uh, here there is a, a posterior subluxation which is associated. You see that the, the, the coccyx moves backward in the sitting position and you can see the fracture line which is here. And here there is a, a separation, a clear separation of the fragments in the sitting position. So it's more easy, it's easier to, to make the diagnosis, but you see, this fracture can be missed very, very easily. The last type of fracture is the type three. It is obstetrical, only obstetrical, with two characteristics that uh, we will see. The mechanism is <coughs> certainly a forced extension of the coccyx when the uh, give, giving way to the, to the baby, but not enough, so the, the coccyx has break. To, to give way to the, to the baby. And the use of a forceps or suction cut is a risk factor. It is a very classical uh, element. There are two diagnostic issues. Uh, the fracture may not appear on an early film because it is an impacted fracture at the beginning. So you, you, you can miss it very easily when the film is taken too early in the following days or weeks after the uh, delivery. But the other problem is that at a later stage, the fracture may resemble a normal disc because there is a progressive separation of the fracture fragment. You will see immediately what I mean. Look at the image on the right side. This is very typical. Two weeks after childbirth, this bone looks normal. It's very hard to guess that there is a fracture line at this level. Every radiologist will miss the fracture. But if you take the film five months later, you can see that there is an opening here. It is, if you have only this film, you, will, you may think that it is a normal disc, one disc, a second disc. <coughs> but if you compare the two films, it is obvious that something abnormal has happened. It is a separation, a progressive separation of the fragments. Why? Because there is a muscle inserting here, which is a levator anni, which pulls down the lower fragment and opens gradually the, the, the, the, the fracture. You can see that here, this is not an end plate. It is a really different from a normal end plate. You see a normal end plate here. It's a, 
uh, it's a line, it's black here, it's <coughs> thick and it's not regular. You see, you have grooves uh, and you have uh, some peaks of holes here, which are mirroring each other. Here, it's more visible three days after giving birth. Yes, there is a contact here, but there is a beginning of an opening here. And six months later, it really looks like a normal disc, but it is not, it is a pseudo arthrosis. So it's a difficult fracture. Uh, if you repeat film, uh, it's, it's easy, but when, when you have no uh, films, uh, when, at the beginning, when you have no repeated films, you have to make the diagnosis on this image. First, the fracture line is not uh, regular. You see, it's not an end plate. It's not smooth. On the contrary, you see here it is the same. It's not smooth. And also, uh, when you uh, take a dynamic films, it is uh, not a normal mobility the fractured fragment, the lower fragment behaves like a loose body with hypermobility or dislocation, either uh, anterior dislocation or, for, or backward dislocation. So remember, if you can compare the films, compare an early film with a later one, and you will have the diagnosis. If you have no uh, early film, you can uh, look at the uh, so-called end plates. In fact, it is not end plate, it is a fracture, or look at the mobility, which is not normal. When uh, you have uh, rolled out all these diagnoses, you are left with around one third of the cases without any clear diagnosis. It's not a luxation, it's not hypermobility, there is no spiral, there is no fracture, it's, it looks normal. So what is it? Let's say that one half, half, sorry, half of this patient respond positively to a steroid injection. So you have to inject the mobile disc, uh, and we can suppose that it is a disease like osteoarthritis, and there is a disc inflammation, and your injection will cure the problem. You see here, the mobility is normal, but there is osteophytes. But the other half, 20%, does not respond to steroid injection. So uh, it is uh, idiopathic coccidinia. It is more complicated. Is it due to pelvic muscle tension? Is it neuropathic pain? Is it the central sensitization? We don't know. Uh, it's interesting to have an MRI, but these 20% of patients are more difficult to manage, of course. We will now see what is important, what is relevant in the uh, clinical examination. Five items are very important. The onset of pain, it can be after a local, local traumatism. You see it's not so frequent, 30%. Of course, uh, the interval between the, the fall of the traumatism and the onset of the pain should not exceed one month. If it is two years before, it's too long. You know, it's not significant. 9% of the coccidinia in my uh, patienthood, in my experience, occurs after giving birth. After weight of loss, 7%, this is very suggestive of a uh, cycle. <coughs> weight loss can be after a diet or bariatric surgery. If you see a patient with uh, coccidinia after bariatric surgery, uh, it's, it's a spike. There is no other possibility. In an obese patient, it is suggestive of fixation. And in a thin, slim, or skinny patient, it is suggestive of spike. So you see, you have some can get some orientation from uh, this uh, feature, it's very easy. Acute pain when standing up uh, is, uh, is uh, a symptom which can uh, sometimes be encountered in the patient. The question, the standard question is, what is the most painful for you sitting or getting up quickly from a seat? And this symptom is highly predictive of the presence of a radiological lesion, luxation or spike. It can also be seen in patients with hypermobility, but not with in patients with a normal uh, dynamic field. You know, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's, symptom, it's a symptom of organicity. It means that there is a lesion. There is something wrong in the scoxis. I have to, to check it, but it's 
a problem. The skin inspection. So you have a continuum of lesion between a mere skin irritation here due to a spicule, a spicule, skin attraction. You know, the skin is pulled from the inside and there is a small depression here or a cutaneous pit, it's a little bit deeper or even a pilonidal sinus that you can see here, very known, but what is not known is the association with a, a spike in the, in the coccyx. So all these uh, cutaneous features are very suggestive of, of the presence of, a, of the spike. It is also sometimes visible on a skin inspection. You can see, I see this uh, statue in uh, Florence in Italy, and this is Hercules fighting a lion alone against the lion, and there is a, a small spike which is visible here. So uh, in, the, in the patient, where, when, you, when you examine the area, you press the skin around the spike and you can see uh, the spicule bulging out of the skin, you see, and you can imagine that it is very aggressive. Well, there is also a maneuver, which is, uh, if you, ah, sorry, it doesn't work, I have not the video, but you, you move your finger to the left and to the right, like uh, a windscreen wiper, and you can see very easily the, the tip of the skin. Here, this lady had a giant spicule, which was really, clearly visible, there was no need to, to press the skin around, it was visible like that. And I, I wonder how this lady managed to, to, to live uh, 35 or 40 years with this abnormality and with a lot of difficulty for CT. She was very better than with an excellent result. Palpation, it's uh, uh, interesting. You can palpate either a sp spike at the tip of the uh, coccyx or Try to palpate if there is a tender joint, uh, external palpation. The rectal exam. The rectal exam, in my experience, I do it every time. Maybe it's not necessary uh, if you have good dynamic fields and a good external palpation, but uh, it is a principle for me. I do systematically the rectal examination because I, I, I in my practice in 35 years, I discovered three tumors of the coccyx or of the sacrum by rectal examination. So I think it's important. You have to ask for positive consent. Of course, it's painful. It's contraindicated in adolescent or maybe even in young adults. And you have to know that in male patients, the coccyx is sometimes very difficult to reach and it's not possible to uh, the palpation concerns the, the muscle, the, the tone of the levator uh, and knee and of the external sphincter, but it concerns also the, uh, the disc. This is a dynamic MRI of the coccyx. The lady is asked to contract her uh, anus, contract the anus, and you can see a contraction of the levator anus with flexion. In fact, this lady had a posterior luxation of the coccyx. And this uh, short film is interesting to see that when you examine clinically, when you assess clinically the mobility of the coccyx, you have two sectors of mobility which have to be assessed separately. You have a sector of flexion of the coccyx this is using when contracting the pelvic floor or when sitting, the coccyx is pushed forward. This is a flexion, a normal flexion. And you have a sector of extension of the coccyx used during defecation or giving birth to, to give way to the, to the baby. And these two sectors of mobility should be considered separately. Because if there is no mobility in flexion, but a normal mobility in extension, the coccyx can be functionally considered as a rigid coccyx for the sitting position. I will give you some examples. This is one of the three tumors I, I made the diagnosis with the rectal examination. So 
I think it is important when the pain is very acute. It is normal way to examine the patient. So mobility inflection. So you start from the neutral position of the coccyx. The neutral position is when the coccyx is at rest, when the patient is lying in a prone position on, on one's face. And the, the flexion can be rigid, normal, or hypermobile, uh, or the extension can be rigid, normal, or even dislocation. Sometimes you can palpate uh, a dislocation. You have to look at the tenderness uh, provoked by the movement and also provoked by the palpation of the disc. And so the, the tumor is one round one for 1,000 patients. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's not always a, a mere chronic pain, mechanical chronic pain. It can be something more serious. So now we will see the different therapeutic strategy for coccidinia. The coping strategy first, it is important to uh, sit in a correct position with a straight back and to avoid the slouching position like that. They are not good for the coccyx. So ask your patient to, to, to sit with a straight back, even a lumbar roll, roll on, the, on the back here to increase the lumbar curvature and to straight with a vertical spine. This is the better position, best position. It's important to have a cushion. Certainly, this is the best cushion with a cutout at the dorsal part and uh, an anterior part, which is thinner than the back part, <clears throat> to be slightly in a bent position. And second, it's also important to limit the sitting, the sitting time. You have, if it is possible, to ask your patient to use a sit-stand workstation to work in the standing position, avoid by bicycling, and sit on the heels when possible to watch TV, for example, or to, to take a breakfast, a, a short meal on a low table. Uh, it is a really better position for the, for the coccyx. So first, avoid sitting position, avoid to sit too much. Second, you, we have the manual treatments. The manual treatments are a very classical way to treat the, the toxins. They are not very efficient, and I never start with a manual treatment, but historically, it is an important part of the management of coccidinia, so we see them uh, in second. It was described first by Tiller, uh, with the technique of massage of the levator ani muscle. It is illustrated here with movement on the muscles. Then uh, mobilization were described by Menno. My father, Robert Meng, described a stretching in extension like that with a strong, powerful extension of the coccyx and a powerful uh, stretching of the muscles, of the pelvic muscle. And myself, I described a, a, a, a stretching, uh, but isolated without uh, acting on the coccyx, just stretching, a mild stretching of the coccyx. I uh, authored two studies to investigate uh, this uh, uh, technique of manual therapy. One was a, conserv a comparative study of the different techniques, and the second was a randomized controlled study with a placebo. Uh, globally, the global success rate was 25%, and the placebo success rate was 12%. The P was 0.06%, uh, uh, so it was not significant, but it was borderline. Uh, on the, with a greater sample of patients, we had more than 100 patients, but maybe with more patients, have been significant. But 25%, this is not a lot. Uh, and the success was uh, a relief of more 50% on the visual analog scales. So it's not a complete recovery. It's not a complete healing. It's a partial uh, result. It's a good result, but it, maybe it's not enough. So there is an efficacy. 
but it clearly it's not enough. The best results were achieved in the coccygeus with normal mobility, so this is important. So I use this manual therapy when there is a failure of the, uh, the injections. And it's better, it works better when there is a short interval of time between onset of coccidinia and the, the management, the manual management. Also, the best results were achieved when there was a low score in the McGill questionnaire, the Dallas Spain questionnaire, but we observed a similar pattern in the control group, which is normal. And when, when you are well in your, in your, in your brain, when your mind is, is good, the results are, are better. And the poorer results were observed in dislocations and in coccygeus with the spikers. This is very logical. This is exactly what was expected. So we can say that these manual treatments works, but not enough. I do not recommend them as a first approach. Third treatment, the intradiscal or apex injection. I describe these two techniques. Uh, so it's very simple with a metallic wire. It is a paper clip which is unfolded with an adhesive tape. So you can uh, localize the, the, the, the, at the tip of the wire, where is the disc that you should, uh, where, where you should enter the needle. Uh, of course, you do that after the dynamic films. You know exactly where you have to put your needle. And here, the needle is into a disc. And here, it is an injection at the apex of the spiker. And you can see these diverticules here. So certainly, there is a, a bursa, which is opacified by the, by the dye. And you inject a few amount of, uh, of cortisone. The results of a single injection, don't look at the table, look only these uh, figures. Uh, you have a, with one injection, you have a good result in 40% of the patient, that's more than six months, and a fair result in 26. Clearly, 65% uh, show a positive response, so fair and good results to a single injection. But it's not enough. There is a need to repeat the injection. The conclusion of this table is that it is mandatory to repeat the injection to perform at least two injections, or in some cases, three injections to, uh, to, to assess the, the, the treatment. In the same study, uh, the patients were assessed at three years after the not after the beginning of the coccidinia, but after entering the study, after inclusion, three years. And it was the result of conservative treatment, not only the injection, but conservative treatments means uh, injection and uh, manual therapy when it was indicated, that is failure of the injection and coccyx with a normal mobility, we can say that. And you can see that we had good results in 47% of the patients. Let's say 50%, 50 one half of the patient achieved a good result with the conservative management. Uh, 43 uh, had a poor results and a fair results with a visual analog scale between three and five in 10%. So the conservative treatment works pretty well. It's a very chronic disease. And 50 persons of good result, it is, uh, it is interesting. What happens for uh, these 43 patients, 33 persons of patients? We will see that, uh, ah, just a reminder, which steroid should be used? If you used a long acting steroid, such as triamcinolone, there is a double risk of skin atrophy. We see this patient, which was injected in an, another center with a skin atrophy, and the spicule is worse now because the, the natural padding with fat is lost due to the atrophy of the skin. And also, there is a certain risk with a triumph alone. It is the onset of calcification. It's not dangerous. It's not really a problem, but of course, it's not satisfying. So. 
please use short acting steroid. Uh, in France, we have prednisolone acetate, which is absolutely excellent, but uh, other short acting steroid are, are maybe, uh, maybe used without problem. So uh, the last uh, easy option is the coccygectomy. Coccygectomy, uh, first, when I, I started to work in the field of coccidinia, there was a global aversion for this uh, operation with some uh, definitive advices in the literature. Coccygectomy gives poor results, says the French rheumatologist. Most surgeons are dissatisfied. Coccidinia is uh, hysterical. Uh, so uh, we try to, to find a good indication yeah. for yeah. Yeah. instability. This is either luxation or hypermobility uh, uh, or spikers. Yeah. And yeah. in our first study, you see it is 15 years ago, we had 90% of good and excellent results with uh, an average time for definitive improvement from four to eight months, it's very long. And uh, a failure rate of let's say 10 10 percent 10 percent of failure and uh, the predictors of good results with the surgery is first the uh, presence of uh, radiologic lesion fixation or hypermobility or spikel also it is very important the temporary success of a guided injection if the patient has been relieved of the pain for one month this is a positive result and uh, it's a predictor of good result in surgery. On the contrary, patients with a failure at the injection have a higher rate of uh, failure with the surgery. Of course, it's classical, no medical legal context and no diffuse pains, which, is, which means fibromyalgia or dysfunction of the central nervous system. So these are the four predictors of a, a good result. There are some other treatments. I, I will not speak about them. I, I don't know them very well. Capsaicin transdermal patch. We will start a study uh, in two months, uh, and we uh, randomized study. The radio frequency of the ganglion impa is also proposed by some some teams. It needs to be evaluated. We have some uh, case reports, but there is not enough in the literature. Uh, uh, I have to say that my surgeon uh, used to remove, to take off this ganglion when he performs a coccygectomy. Uh, for the 10 years ago, it started to, to, to take this ganglion off, to take it off, and the, the results seem to be better. The results of surgery seems to be better when the ganglion in part has been taken off during the surgery. So maybe there, we need we need more studies for that. So uh, we we are uh, coming to the to the conclusion. Uh, I have two conclusions for you. The first is that the pathology of the coccyx has no originality. It's exactly the same pathology which is encountered in the local in the musculoskeletal system. You have luxation, you have hypermobility, you have osteoarthritis, you have bursitis. All of that is exactly what is found in the other joint, uh, not at the same frequencies. Of course, it's different, but there is no originality. This is very important. And the second conclusion is that there is a question which arises. It is, wh why, why do we have a coccyx? What is the coccyx for? What is the role of the coccyx? Uh, when the coccyx is rigid, when there is a lack of curvature, uh, it is very frequently a painful coccyx. A good coccyx is curved, slightly curved, and uh, with uh, it is slightly supple. And so we can suppose that the coccyx acts like a transitional structure between the rigid sacrum and the soft perineum. It can go for the skin, it is protective for the skin, Progressively, uh, it passes from a, a rigid bone to a soft uh, part of the body. And this uh, progressivity is, uh, is attributable to the, to the coccyx. Okay, this is uh, the, last, uh, the last slide. Uh, thank you very much.
Uh, I can stop now the presentation and uh, I am ready for the for the questions. If you have any any questions, of course, you are welcome. Thank you, sir. It was a very big pleasure. It was very comprehensive and a very complex lecture. Yes, of course, it's, it's a complicated topic. I try to, to sum it up in, uh, in uh, 45 minutes, you see, but there is a, a lot of things to, to, to, to, to see, but this is the core of what you have to know if you want to uh, manage a patient with a coccidinia. Yes, sir, before I proceed to the uh, questions of our participants, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, after uh, how much time we can say that the patient has failed conservative treatment and we can offer him surgery? Well, it can be very, very quick because uh, le let's suppose a patient with uh, a luxation, this is a severe lesion, you do an injection. Uh, if there is a quick relapse of the pain, the patient is better, let's say, for three weeks, four weeks, and there is a relapse of the pain, uh, you can offer surgery uh, without problem. You are on the, on the good way, you know, to, for, for the management. So surgery uh, can be offered very quickly when there is an important lesion. On the contrary, when the case is difficult, it's better to wait to try the different conservative managements before proposing surgery. Anyway, uh, surgery can be proposed only when there is a lesion of the coccyx observable that you can see on the dynamic films, or when the mobility is normal, if there is a positive response to an injection. When there is a positive response to an injection, it means that there is osteoarthritis or there is some inflammation of the disc. And if the second injection is not efficient as was the first, you can offer surgery. So two indications, first, the presence of a lesion, or second, no lesion visible, but uh, the success of an injection. Thank you, sir. I'll proceed with uh, the questions of our participants. Uh, Dr. Selim Bozda from Izmir Atatur Hospital Training and Research Hospital. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. It is a great opportunity Amen. for us to listen to this subject from you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Turgat Özal from Medical Center and Dr. Shain Kenan Dennis. Thank you for, so thank you, sir, for your, uh, your share for the great experiences. When you see any skin findings, do you scan, scan of neural canal for a cartation or other diseases like a spina bifida occulta? Uh, I think it is uh, the, the same family of uh, with the spina bifida occulta, the spikers. But in my experience, we, we, we don't find this uh, uh, type of lesion. There is a spikel, it is an isolated lesion of the tip of the coccyx. Uh, there is no uh, problem such as a spina bifida, never. But I suppose it is. Uh, a similar mechanism. I don't know. I don't know. My opinion is that in is some in some cases the spikers are due to an abnormality during the the fetal developments of the, of the fetus. I think there is an adhesion between the the tip of the coccyx and the layer of cells which will become the skin. The two structure sticks one against another, and when they try to separate the skin or what will become the skin, pulls the, the, the coccyx, pulls the, what, what will become the coccyx outside, and the coccyx attracts the skin inside. Hence, the pylonidal sinus on one side and the spicule on the other side. I think that the two structures uh, uh, adhesive one to another, sticks one to another during the fetal life. I think that this is the mechanism of the spike. But this Thank is you. a hypothesis, of course. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hassan Kamil Suju from Izmir, he's asking, thank, uh, he's saying, thank you, sir, for this great lecture. And his question is, 
is it comp compulsory to make a diagnostic block before radio frequency ovulation of ganglion in part? Uh, I think that it is a good practice to first anesthetize the ganglion and assess with a long acting uh, anesthetic and to assess the patient. The, the radio frequency should be performed only when the, the patient has been improved by the, by the block, by the anesthetic block. If there is no, no improvement after anesthetization of the ganglion, I think that the, uh, the odds for success of the radio frequency are very low. I think it is a good practice. And I know some doctors who also inject a, a steroid agent. They do the block, they inject a steroid, they assess the patient uh, immediately after the block, and they also assess uh, the patient a few a couple of weeks after to see if the cortisone has had an effect or not. So yes, definitely it's mandatory to, to block the ganglion. Thank you, sir. Dr. Nirowak Kosmaye from Izmir Atatürk and Training and Research Hospital says, thank you, sir. It was a great lecture. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, AFP Jaco says, brilliant as always, fantastic resume. Thank you, Dr. Jaco is my fellow orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I, it's, I'm very glad that he can uh, uh, be part of the audience. He, he knows that, of course, uh, <laughs> he has seen this presentation many times. But if you have some uh, technical a question regarding the surgery, regarding the operation. I'm sure that uh, we can uh, give you a uh, response, of course. Thank you, sir. Ihan, Ihan Kanat asks, you showed mostly patients with vertical sac sacrum. Is vertical or horizontal sacrum has an effect on fracture in this area? Ah, this is an excellent question. A vertical sacrum is not good, is not very functional. Uh, you can have a vertical sacrum and never, never, never uh, experience coccyx pain, of course, but I think it is not good on a mechanical point of view. Why? Because uh, if you have no curvature of the sacrum, the tip of the sacrum, I mean S4 and S5, will be protruding uh, on the skin and uh, will make the sitting position not very comfortable. And uh, the skin, uh, the subcutaneous tissues are at risk. So there is a risk of bursitis and there is also a risk of dislocation because if, if the sacrum, look at me, is, when, the, when the sacrum is curved like that, when you sit down, there is a flexion of the sacrum. You see, this is the normal uh, behavior of the coccyx, there is a flexion, and it is a shock absorber, in fact. Okay, when the sacrum is, ri when the sacrum is rigid, it will, um, it will um, hurt the, the, the, the skin like that, and there is a, a risk, maybe of fracture, but this is very rare, but certainly of fixation. And I see a lot of fixation with a vertical sacrum. Certainly, uh, this uh, particular anatomy of the sacrum, this feature of the sacrum is a risk factor for fixation, certainly, and also for fracture. It's the same, the same mechanism. Thank you, sir. Tuba Taniel is asking, she's saying first, thank you for your great presentation, sir. What is your local anesthetic preference for intradiscal injections? I use uh, lidocaine which is a short-acting steroid, uh, one percent lidocaine. It's no problem, no, no allergy, never, never a problem with that. And her second question is, can intradiscal radio frequency application be beneficial in patients who have benefited intradiscal injection? I have no experience of uh, radio frequency lesion of the disc. Absolutely no experience. I know <clears throat> about the, the, the destruction of the ganglion impar with uh, radio frequency, but not uh, about the, the disc. There are many treatments which certainly are promising or interesting, and which should be assessed by a uh, short study, you know, 
a randomized study or by comparing with uh, with a steroid injection because we we don't know but maybe it works of course that would be interesting to know we we need a study for that we need we need a, a study thank you sir um, i don't see any more questions uh, if there are no more questions i can give the word to our teacher hasan kamil sujuk uh, i want to thank you dr main he has enormous experience about coxidinia. For us, it was a great opportunity to listen to his lecture. Thank uh, you. Thank by thank the way, uh, I want to listen shortly uh, of his experience about uh, coccyx excision from Dr. Jacob, if you want to, if he want to speak. Uh, Atajan, Dr. Can you turn on the microphone? This is now I can activate the microphone. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joy, for this fantastic presentation because when you hear it, you have all everything in one package. So uh, it's, uh, it's a real world. And, uh, and obviously, you had your 25, at least 25 years of experience on coccygectomy. Uh, we've started working together like four years ago, and uh, I saw so many patients. I told him that you, you, uh, we have all the patients operated, and he told me no, 17 percent. So he treats at least 80 percent of the patients um, medically, and then after we go to the surgery when we don't, uh, when injections don't work anymore, and. Uh, uh, in some cases with uh, big speakers or malformative, heavily malformative uh, cases. So we remove the coccyx. Removing the coccyx is not very difficult, but the problem is you get a 50% rate of infection if you uh, are not very careful. So with the um, uh, methods that we were teach to me and uh, we improved on that, I think we are less now than one of the 20 patients with an infection, which is still too much, but it's very low. And uh, when you get an abscess, you just uh, make a surgery again, clean it, and take antibiotics, and it takes eight days and doesn't change the end result. So, uh, so the surgery is very safe, and there are no other complications, we call it. Any question? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I have one question for Dr. Jaco. Uh, sir, how much proximal and distal you go in your technique and how much of an anatomical tissue you resect? And we do a direct approach and we remove all the conflicting and moving parts. I used to remove all the conflicting parts in the dislocations and the, all the moving parts in the dislocations and all the conflicting parts in the spicules. And the, more and more, I take out all the coccyx because if we, uh, um, some patients take a very long time to be improved or some patients don't feel a great improvement. And if you still find that, that there is still a coccygeal part, we'll think that it could have been uh, better. So uh, now I take all the coccygeal parts. What I feel is the coccyx. Because usually in 60% of the cases, the first coccygeal vertebra is fused with the second. So usually I take the maximum of the coccyx. We've been having questions on if we, uh, on the speakers, we just take out the speaker and leave the rest. But if the patient still has pain, we'll not be very happy. So I take out the coccyx. Thank you. And uh, after the surgery, uh, I say to the patient that uh, the, pain for the, the pain for the surgery lasts about uh, 15 to uh, 15 days to three weeks. But the pain for the coccyx takes a very different amount of time. It can take a, a lot of time, like months or even years. And in some patients, it's very fast. And uh, we've done that for a long time, but uh, it's still difficult to know. I think there is a direct relation with the uh, duration of the pain. And in some cases with very big speakers, you take, you take out the speakers the patient has no pain anymore. No question about that. Thank you, sir. 
Okay. Uh, Thank you. There is one more question for, from Ferhat Harman. His question is: uh, Infection is serious problem. Is serious problem after surgery? What is your advice to deal with it? Uh, we take a long time thinking about that, and uh, Levan Dorsonian uh, did that like 20 years ago, and so we have a very um, serious. Um, I mean, it's uh, we have a protocol which is very serious. Before the surgery, you give a patient an enema to uh, to uh, empty the uh, bowels. And after the surgery, they are put under IV uh, antibiotics with uh, flagyl. And, uh, and uh, after the surgery, they are forbidden to uh, sit. Excuse me. After the surgery, they are forbidden to sit for three weeks. So they have to uh, eat uh, standing or lying or uh, sitting on their, on their heels. Uh, and this has changed everything. And also, we use uh, now use uh, intradermic uh, adsorbable suture, but we use uh, cyanocrylate glue. And uh, we have a thinking it was the final nail in the coffin. So uh, that's uh, we have very good results with that. We have less than one of the twenty patients with an infection now. And. When we have an infection, we treat them, and uh, so you open them again, you treat them with the same antibiotics. And uh, I, have I had several of them uh, till now, and we never had uh, a failure. All the patients with infections had been cured. We never had a chronic infection. Thank you, sir. I think we finished all. Comments and questions, Edwin? Yes, we have finished all the questions. Yeah. Uh, May, Dr. May. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th th thank you very much for uh, this uh, invitation again. It was a pleasure for me. And uh, if you want some information, it's possible to email me, send me an email, and I will be very glad to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a Bye -bye. useful uh, meeting and 45 people attended That's the great. meeting. Thank you for organizing. All no, no, 54. No, 54 people. Uh, yeah. people. I think Jumur Kalinchan wants to speak. Okay. Jumur Kalinchan. Yumur Kılıçar, tamam hocam. Ay kaldırmış gözüküyor. İyi. Uh, thank, you. thank you for organizing this meeting, which was great. And uh, I recognize several of you. Uh, and uh, I'm very impressed by your group and your uh, and willingness to uh, to make things happen. That's very great. Thank you. Uh, uh, he's Yumur Kılıçar. Yeah. Atacağım. Sesini açtım hocam. Sesini İstekli açacak. İstekli verdin mi? İstekli yolladın mı hocam? E, merhaba herkese. Çok teşekkür ederim organizasyon için. El kaldırmadım. Alkış hareketi o. <gülüyor> Sadece o. Eplaz. Eplaz. Eplaz. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. May, you want to say? Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will send you the uh, pictures. And when I put uh, the video recording to the uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel, I will inform you. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Atacan, please.